What's going on guys? I'm back with another video and we're going to continue our series on breast pathologies and conditions. Um, I've covered in a previous video looking at some of the breast conditions that are considered inflammatory. And in this particular video, we're going to look at breast conditions that are considered the benign breast conditions. So let's move right into this. Here's the list that I had covered in the previous uh, video of the main topics within breast pathology. We have inflammatory breast conditions, benign breast conditions, malignant breast conditions, and congenital breast anomalies. So in this video, we're going to be covering the benign breast conditions. So to start, here's the list of the main benign breast conditions that you need to be familiar with for your board exam. Uh, just to go ahead and begin on this, these last three are fairly simple, so I won't cover very much on them. It's really just knowing the definition, some of the things that can cause it, and then the general treatment or things you would do to manage each of those. The main things that I would focus on that are a little more, you would need to study a little bit more, are these four primary things. Fibrocystic change disease, and there's other names for that. Uh, it can also be called cystic mastitis or mammary dysplasia. So then fibroadenoma is what we're going to move into after that, then the phylloides tumor after that, and then we're going to close with introductal papilloma. Now fibroadenoma and phylloides tumor you're going to see are very similar and I'm going to show you the distinguishing characteristics that separate these two. And then introductal papilloma kind of stands alone as far as a benign breast condition, but there's a very similar malignant breast condition and I'm going to show you how to distinguish those two. So let's move right into this. Fibrocystic change. So this is as a basic definition. All this means is that you're going to have cysts with surrounding fibrosis um, anywhere in the terminal duct unit. So I'm going to show you. So in previous videos, I kind of broke down the general functional unit of breast tissue. What you have is you have things called lobules. And they act as a functional kind of gland unit of breast tissues. And you can have cells inside of these lobules. So these are all lobules I've drawn here. They basically help with the production and secretion of milk. And they send all of the milk that they produce into what's called a duct. So you have lobules and you have ducts. And then the milk that's produced goes through the duct and then it exits out through the nipple uh, for breastfeeding for the infant. Okay, so that's the general premise behind breast tissue, the functional parenchyma of breast tissue. So in this particular disease, you have the formation of cyst inside the parenchyma of breast tissue. Now, you can have a cyst over here, you can have a cyst over here. In other words, it's anywhere in the parenchyma. And along with those cysts, you often will have fib fibrous tissue that will surround it as a result of kind of it impinging on the surrounding parenchyma. So you have cyst, and then a lot of times you can have surrounding fibrosis with that. Now there's another thing that you can also have sometimes, and it's called apocrine metaplasia. Let me remind you that metaplasia just means a change from one cell type to another. So if you had apocrine metaplasia, that's saying that it's not saying you're changing the apocrine cells. It's saying you're changing whatever cell is at that origin that you're referring to and it's turning into apocrine cells. Remember, apocrine cells are kind of uh, defined in line with uh, the modified sweat glands or sweat gland um, cells that are uh, that have that kind of function. So you can also have apocrine metaplasia where you begin to have these sweat tight modified cells um, in the general location. Now. There's something really important I want to say about fibrocystic changes disease or fibrocystic change. I already mentioned to you that it has other names. So don't just remember it as fibrocystic change disease. You can also recognize it as something called cystic mastitis. That's another name for it. And that intuitively makes sense because you can have cysts all in the, the mastitis. Masto is the root word for in mastitis. Masto just refers to breast. So you have cyst all in the breast tissue, and it can also be called mammary, mammary dysplasia. Okay, and that's just saying that you're having a change in the mammary tissue. So either one of those names fits into this general uh, definition for fibrocystic changes. Now, fibrocystic changes is not only defined or held to just the premise of cysts with surrounding fibrosis and then possible apocrine metaplasia. These are all of the possible changes you could see in the varying presentation of fibrocystic change. You can see cysts. 
you can see surrounding fibrosis, you can see that apocrine metaplasia, but then you can see other things as well. And these other things I'm going to mention carry with them an increased risk for you, for the patient to develop invasive lobular or ductal carcinoma. In other words, the invasive breast carcinomas. Now, these are the things that are malignant. Now, this disease by itself is benign. Yes, that's true. And if the disease were to only have cyst, fibrosis, or and or apocrine metaplasia, it, it ha carries no increased risk. The increased risk occurs when you have any of these other additional features that are possible. And the additional features that are possible, the, f the first one is sclerosing adenosis. I'm going to explain what that is. The next one is duct hyperplasia. And the last one is atypical ductor, ductal, ductal or lobular hyperplasia. Now, each one of these carries a relative increased risk as far as a, a, a times risk of how much that will increase your chance of getting this invasive lobular or ductal carcinoma. Sclerosing, adenosis, and duct hypoplasia both in, uh, causes the increased risk to be about two times an increased risk of this invasive breast carcinoma. The last one, which is the most severe, is atypical ductor, ductal or lobular hyperplasia. This carries about a five times increased risk. So what are those three things? Sclerosing adenosis, I always teach you, remember, to break down the words. Sclerosing is just telling you that you're having some sclerosis or you're having this buildup of collagen that's causing sclerosis. So if we go back to our unit, our uh, functional parenchyma, these are the lobules, remember, that I drew out, and those are the things that produce milk. And they produce milk and they send it into the duct to then be secreted out um, through the nipple for the baby. So this is the duct and this is the lobules. In sclerosing adenosis, you're having an increased amount of the lobules. And with this, with when you have too many lobules, you begin to have this increased collagen all around the area, and that's what causes the sclerosis. So sclerosing adenosis is just an increase in the number of lobules in the lobule section, and that can cause surrounding collagen buildup, which will cause sclerosis. Now, when you look at this, under imaging, when you use imaging to look at this, whether it's mammography or, or, or whatever, you will you can a lot of times see calcification. It will present with calcification. So when that collagen and all that begins to build up in big levels um, and it begins to have that sclerosis, some of it will calcify. This is very high yield because calcification is oftentimes a symbol used for certain types of malignant breast cancers. So this is why this particular disease has to be very carefully monitored and you really have to do a good job of differentiating this on uh, histology and also with imaging um, to make sure because calcification will throw you off into thinking this is a malignant disease itself, but it is not. But if it has these three features, of the five of the, I'm sorry, of the six possible, because the have cyst fibrosis, apocrine metaplasia, they don't carry an increased risk for malignancy. But these other three can increase your risk for a malignant invasive carcinoma of the breast. Okay, so what's the other feature about this? This is due to estrogen. Now, they don't know the exact particular cause, but they know that this particular disease seems to always arrive around estrogen or progesterone spikes whether it be up or down. Now, it's important you know that, whether it be up or down. I'm going to tell you why. This particular disease seems to present itself around periods of pregnancy. So periods of pregnancy. Around the female's puberty time. Around the female's periods. So you would think that all of this has massive uh, discrepancies and, ch or, I'm sorry, hormonal ups and downs in all of these. Oh, and also around the time, around the time of menopause. So not after menopause when all the hormones are typically going way lower. So what happens? In periods of pregnancy, those levels go way up and this disease can start to present. In periods of puberty, your hormone levels go way up. This can start to present. Around the time of the female's period, this uh, your hormone levels go way up. Then this will this can start to show up. And around times of menopause, this can go up. Now, in menopause, around usually your levels are beginning to go down, but you also see this fibrocystic change around that time. When you don't see this is postmenopausal, when it stays flat. When you don't see this is 
in a, in a young child who hasn't hit puberty. So really young girl, you're not going to typically see fibrocystic change. This is very important to know because this disease can come and go. Uh, during a female's period, you can all of a sudden begin to, on a physical exam, you notice tender breast nodules, which are basically just the cysts with the surrounding fibrosis and, and various irregularities of the breast. And then all of a sudden, once her period is over, uh, that seems to go away. So this estrogen progesterone spiking up and down can cause this presentation of disease to go, come and go um, as it pleases according to the hormone spikes of estrogen and progesterone up or down. Okay, physical exam, it's going to be tender breast nodules. I put this in red, tender. I'm going to show you why this is so important because in all of the other benign conditions that we're going to talk about, none of them are usually tender. But in this particular benign breast condition, you will have tender breast nodules. The way I remember that is this. I read this. First of all, I read the disease, fibrocystic changes. That tells me a lot of things. Fibro tells me that we're going to have some sort of fibrous tissue. I said that there was surrounding fibrous tissue usually in this disease. Cystic tells you that there's going to be cysts often present. Changes tells you that this will change with your hormone level. This can change with your hormone level. So as you go up in estrogen and progesterone, it can present and after the period's over and, and the hormone levels maybe go back down or level off, this can disappear again. In periods of pregnancy, when they go way up, this can show up. When the pregnancy is over, it can go back down. So that tells you a lot of things just in the title. But I also look at the fibro part of fibrocystic and I deliberately pronounce it, deliberately pronounce it fire, fire cystic. The reason I do that is because fire is really hot and that could be painful to the touch. Really try to drill this in your head. Fire, fire cystic changes, it is, fire is hot to the touch and it can be painful. Therefore, these are tender. This will help you distinguish. In a patient who comes in and they don't have typical symptoms of a malignant type of disease, for example, they don't have the weight loss, they don't have the night sweats, you know, the more, they, you know, night sweats, they don't have um, maybe a low-grade fever, so you're not thinking that this is a really advanced type of cancer, right? So you're thinking more of, if they didn't have any of that, you're thinking benign. But if they had this stuff, you're thinking of malignant. So if we've already figured out that this particular patient has none of these really serious symptoms, we start to think, okay, this maybe could be more benign in nature. And then we think of, okay, you could ask the patient the question, is it tender? Or you could palpate it yourself and figure out that, you know, ask the patient, does that hurt? Or do they show any sort of uh, squinting on their face or signs that something is hurting when you touch it? Uh, that's really high yield for fibrocystic change that can help you to distinguish this particular disease. And the last thing is if they were to do a surgical excision of this particular disease um, and take it out and, and because say the cysts were causing tons of problems, which typically you don't have to do that, but say they were to have a gross pathology of this and they cut out a cyst, the cyst itself, when you look at it with the naked eye, it will appear as blue domed. The way I remember this is because I look back at our title again. I've already said, I broke down the word. Fibro is standing for fibrous tissue. Cystic is for cyst. Changes tells you it changes with hormone level. Then you can pronounce it fire cystic. That should tell you, oh, this is going to be something that's tender because fire is hot to the touch. The last thing I want you to think to yourself is when you say fire cyst, it sounds like you're basically saying the fire is cyst. Like it's going out, the fire is being put out. And when fire is gone, you naturally, the temperature goes down and, and a relative color for a temperature decrease or something that's cold is blue. That's how I think of all this together. Fire for hot to the touch, fire cystic. So fire, the fire has sizzled out. Now it's gone down in temperature and it is blue, blue domed cyst. It's, you may think that's stupid in the way I'm using this, but I'm telling you these kind of dumb mnemonics and tricks can help you to remember that this one has blue dome cyst versus all of the other ones we're going to cover and all of the malignant breast conditions. So you don't mix up and you can remember that this one is the one with blue dome cyst on gross pathology. Okay, the next one is fibroadenoma. This is just a tumor composed of fibrous tissue and glands in equal proportion. That's going to become very important when I go over the next one. Now, let's again look at the word. It sounds complex, fibroadenoma. Just look at the word. Fibro, fibrous tissue, Adeno, adenoma or adeno. Adeno refers to glands. Whenever you hear adeno, it's referring to some sort of gland or gland secretion. So what are you having in this disease? You're having a tumor composed of fibrous tissue and glands. 
It's literally in the word. So that helps huge to break down the word like we always do in most videos. How does this, how does this present or how would this present on a physical exam? So on physical exam, it's going to be what's called marble like a marble is usually extremely firm. It's, it's, it has very clear defined round borders. So it's distinct borders and marbles are very easy to roll mobile and firm. When you press against this particular uh, mass, this fibroadenoma, it will easily be mobile. It will move around very easily. And this particular one is non-tender. You're going to notice a trend in all of the disease we talk about. They're all non-tender from here on out for the breast tumors per se, the benign breast tumors. They're all non-tender except for fibrocystic changes. Remember, fire cystic sizzles out. And uh, fi fibro, fire, right? Fire cystic. So that helps you remember tender. So this one is tender, but all the other ones we're going to talk about are non-tender. Okay, I, but I'm deliberately keep repeating that because that is extremely high yield to begin to dis uh, differentiate these diseases on a test question or in clinic. Now, this one is also estrogen and progesterone sensitive. So who does this typically present in? Fertile females. Anywhere in the realm of fertile females around puberty, this can present. Um, as they're having all of their periods and having those spikes in estrogen and progesterone, this can present. This can present pre, so in other words, pre-menopausal women. But it won't typically present in a patient who hasn't hit puberty yet because they haven't had these spikes in these hormones. And it also will not present in post-menopausal. It will not present in post-menopausal women because they have had a massive decrease in estrogen and progesterone um, as a whole. Now, when I say it will not, I'm saying that in most, most cases it won't. You may have some rare cases where it will be in a postmenopausal woman, but in most cases it is estrogen and progesterone limited. Okay, that's fibroadenoma. Now, I had said earlier this is going to become very important. Let me clear all of this out. In equal proportion, the fibrous tissue and the glands in the tumor itself will be in relative equal proportion, 50-50. You could say around 50-50. Now, let's look at the next one, phylloides tumor. This is the exact same definition, a tumor composed of fibrous tissue and glands, but there is more fibrous tissue in this one than glands. What is the end result of that? Say, you know, and I'm just making this up, but say there's three-fourth fibrous tissue and one-fourth, you know, glands, and it can vary, but just know that usually the proportion is going to be far more fibrous than it is glands, okay? What does that mean? That means when you look at histology, you have so much fibrous tissue that it begins to protrude out through the borders of where the tumor lies, like the cortex of the tumor itself. It will protrude out and make something that looks a lot like a leaf, okay? And that's what then you'll often see in this one. You'll see something called leaf-like projections on histology. They can even say it, they can say it, or they can show you on imaging of the tumor on histology. You'll see this little projection out. This is called a leaf-like projection, and that is due to the fibrous tissue overwhelming the general structure of the tumor and pushing out. Um, because remember, fibrous tissue is very invasive. Okay. This can be benign or malignant. That's very important too. The reason that's important is because, yes, we're, we're covering benign breast conditions, but this one can be benign or malignant, and that's going to affect the treatment for this particular one. If this one can be benign or malignant, naturally, because you don't know, if it, maybe early on, if it's benign or malignant when you first catch it, the treatment needs to be to take it all, to resect it. So surgical resection would be the treatment in this particular, in this phylloides tumor. But in the previous one, in fibroadenoma, the treatment, it's not as serious to surgically resect it. Okay? You don't have to surgically resect this one. This one you can more or less just monitor, and then if you have a lot of, you know, really bad, if it's really symptomatic, then maybe you can consider surgical resection. But surgical resection is, as a whole, not necessary in fibroadenoma. But in Floyd's tumor, because of that possibility of it being malignant, you do want to do surgical resection in all cases of a Floyd's tumor. And again, it's non-tender. I said the only one of these primary uh, breast uh, conditions, these benign breast conditions that's tender, is going to be what we covered, fibrocystic changes or fire cystic changes. And that means tender, tender to the touch, like fire hurts you to the touch. Okay, so that is um, Floyd's tumor. And this one is not hormone sensitive. That's important because who does it commonly present in? Postmenopausal women. Postmenopausal. In fibroadenoma, who does it commonly present in? It commonly presents in premenopausal women. 
of course, the premenopausal women that have had their puberty. They have to be old enough to have had puberty and had that spike in uh, hormones to have the hormone sensitivity. So there's a difference in age to help you distinguish as well between these two. The next one is intraductal papilloma. Again, just look at the word. I've noticed in all of breast pathology, if you just break down the word, you kind of have it. Intra means inside. Ductal is referring to the duct in the functional unit of breast. And papilloma is referring to a papilla. What is a papilla? A papilla is just a finger-like growth out from the typical epithelium, and it has what's called a fibrovascular core. So there's vasculature that's kind of formed inside of this papilla, and then it has the epithelium of wherever it is up over it. Okay, that is what is a papilla. So you have this growth, and the growth would just happen to be inside the duct of the parenchyma of the breast tissue. Remember, the lobules are over here, so it's not... It's not typically over here at the lobules, it's inside the duct, and it would be then kind of like over here attached to this wall. Okay, that's that's what a papilla is. Papilla has that epithelium over it with a fibrovascular core. Okay, so it's a finger-like outgrowth lined by epithelium. Now, there's something very high yield about this disease. Both epithelia is present. I mentioned this I covered this a little bit in my video on inflammatory breast conditions, that there are two layers to the to the parenchyma or the functional part of breast tissue. And this is two layers for the lobules and two layers for the ducts. There's two layers. The first layer is the luminal cells. Or in other words, that's telling you exactly where they are. They're along the lumen of the duct, right? So there's luminal cells, and those cells are typically columnar. And then underneath that, there's cells that are more squamous in appearance. They're more flat or pancake-like. Those are called myoepithelial cells. And if you break down that word, it tells you what they do. Myo refers to muscle epithelial for epithelium. So they are muscle-like cells of the epithelium. They help contract and push the milk out. Okay. So in this disease, you have both, both epitheliums are present. In other words, both cell types. So you have the luminal cell layer present so you have luminal cells plus myoepithelial both are here that becomes very important when we cover the next uh it's not necessarily the disease the the next disease is not necessarily in this benign breast conditions uh powerpoint but it's in a the malignant type of breast conditions powerpoint that i'm going to do be doing completing soon now if they told you, if they described everything just like this, they said that you have some sort of papilla growth inside the ducts of the functional breast tissue, and it's a finger-like outgrowth, and you already know, oh, they're referring to some type of papilla, right? And so you know right away that they're describing this introductal papilloma. But they tell you that there's an absence of myoepithelial cells. They tell you there's an absence of myoepithelial cells. In other words, now the epithelium that is over this papilla that has the fibrovascular core it's only one epithelial layer and the entire layer is only luminal cells that is no longer called an introductal papilloma now that is called a papillary carcinoma of the breast now that is malignant that's far more dangerous so such a minute detail just the fact that you don't have these myoepithelial cells present in the papillary carcinoma, which is a malignant breast cancer, versus an introductal papilloma, which is benign. And the, the main primary main difference is that you have both of the, the cell types, the two epithelium, instead of the absence of myoepithelial cells. That's very, you have to make sure, you have to know for a fact that you're reading this right. That's why a lot of biopsies come up false. The biopsies are misread or you miss something. You're like, oh, I thought, you know, I saw both layers, but in fact, there was only one layer. So then you misread a benign breast cancer versus a malignant, which could be detrimental for the patient. That's why the treatment is surgery. Even though this is benign, you need to have surgery to take this out. Okay. It doesn't matter whether, you know, you know for a fact it's introductal. You never know for sure, so just go ahead and resect it out and be safe. That's why the treatment is surgical resection in this. So we covered the fact that this is a formation of papilla inside the ducts, how the papilla looks, that both epithelium are present, and that's what makes this one benign versus papillary carcinoma, which is malignant and lacks myoepithelial cell epithelium. And then both of them will have bloody nipple discharge. The way I remember this is this. 
Don't forget, papillas have a fibrovascular core. Vascular, so if it's a vascular system, there's blood inside that. There's a vascular network. Naturally, if that were to be damaged as milk goes over it, or as that penetrates out, somehow there's some sort of damage to the epithelium over the papilla, that can send blood out, and therefore you can have a bloody nipple discharge. That's the way I remember this. And this is in premenopausal women. Okay, so that is introductal papilloma, keeping in mind that you must differentiate this from papillary carcinoma. How do you do it? Because papillary carcinoma has no myoepithelial cells. No myoepithelial cells. And we'll talk more about that disease in the module on the malignant breast conditions. Let's move to the last three, which are really simple. I'm not going to spend much time on these. These aren't necessarily tumors per se. Um, but they can show up on the exam, and you don't want to miss an easy question. Galactorrhea, that just means milk discharge outside of lactation. Really straightforward. In other words, if you had a child, you you, you know, a female had a child, she will develop uh, breast milk and then t- to be able to breastfeed the baby. That's normal. That is not galactorrhea. Galactorrhea is when you have breast milk, but it's outside of the period of lactation. Okay, and this can be due to medications or pathologies that alter prolactin and dopamine balance. I want to remind you how these two hormones work together. Prolactin and dopamine have an inverse relationship to each other in the body. That means if you have an increase in prolactin, whether it be from a prolactinoma or medications that cause an increase in prolactin, you will thus then automatically lower your dopamine levels. And and the vice versa. If you had an increased dopamine level, if you had an increased dopamine, you are then thus going to automatically lower your level of prolactin. Now, what would happen? Remember the function of prolactin? The function of prolactin is to, to assist in milk production. To assist in milk production. If you had something, whether you were taking a medication or let's say you were taking a medication that was a dopamine antagonist, that means it will thus shut down dopamine production or stop its function or something that would damage dopamine levels in the body. And in other words, whatever's going to happen, you're basically going to present as if you had decreased dopamine levels. When you have decreased dopamine levels, that allows, because it's an inverse relationship, that allows prolactin levels to go up. What happens when you have an increased prolactin level? You have increased milk production. And with increased milk production, you could then run into a situation of galactorrhea when there's levels of prolactin go too high. Another situation that could cause galactorrhea is if you had a prolactinoma. Now this one wouldn't need to go through any sort of alteration of dopamine. The fact that you have a prolactinoma, a tumor, there at the area of the brain that is going to produce prolactin, that means you have uncontrolled prolactin levels. And naturally, in this tumor, the levels of dopamine would go down, but that wouldn't matter. In other words, you didn't have the start. It wasn't starting from some sort of change in dopamine. It was just reacting to this uncontrolled prolactin-producing tumor um, in the brain. So with this increased prolactin level that you're having, then that means you're having tons of milk production that you can't seem to stop. And you won't be able to negatively um, feed back and shut this off. So what you're going to end up having is increased milk production that could cause the uh, galactorrhea. Uh, as well. So those are just two examples of what can cause galactorrhea. Next is galactoseal. This is exactly, notice this is a similar title as the first one. Galactorrhea was just milk discharge outside of lactation. A galactoseal is, and think of something is sealed in something. This is just because of milk that somehow gets obstructed in the duct, you begin, you develop a cyst full of milk. Now remember, this is non-tender. You may think to yourself, how is a cyst non-tender? Or how, you know, you, you don't mix up cysts and abscess, but how is a cyst itself going to be, you know, non-tender? If you think of a cyst, you think eventually that could become tender or painful. It's non-tender in this situation because milk is sterile. The milk produced by the mother is sterile. So the so if that's all, if it's just a cyst filled with milk, this is not going to be something that you would think would cause a necessarily massive inflammatory response. Thus, why this disease is not considered an inflammatory breast uh, condition. Okay, so this is non-tender. And the treatment for this is needle aspiration. That's just a fancy thing of saying they're going to put a needle in the cyst and they're going to pull the milk out. And they may have to do this a couple times 
But if you're having really bad symptoms from these milk cysts, if it's beginning to protrude around the surrounding breast tissue and then eventually could lead to pain, not because of the cyst itself, but because of how big it could get or other sort of problems, then you would think of surgical excision. But in most cases, needle asp repeated needle, needle aspiration would be the treatment for a galactosil. Next is gy gynecomastia. This is uh, basically just when you develop breast tissue when you're not supposed to. So you're like, basically, this is a proliferation, a pro hyper proliferation, hyper proliferation of breast tissue. Okay, hyper proliferation of breast tissue. And that's what he says right here. This is just basically by general definition, a proliferation of mammary tissue. In females, naturally, this is not abnormal, but it is abnormal in a female when you have too much. In the case of a pathological gynecomastia, it can be abnormal um, in females. And then, of course, in males, even though males have breasts as well, just not as much. You could say they have breast tissue. Um, it's more noticeable in males. Let's just say that. So normal finding. Now, this is normal. Uh, a mother brings a baby to the pediatric clinic. She says, my, my baby, you know, seems to be developing, you know, breast tissue for whatever reason that you would typically look to begin symptoms and appearance that you would begin to have around puberty time, right? That is actually normal. And because babies are going through so many hormone changes um, at that young age, it also can sometimes be normal in teen boys, especially teen boys who are sessile or like very inactive. Uh, that can happen. And then it can also happen in elderly men from the massive drop in testosterone that can occur in that age group. Okay. So, so this is, a, it can also be a side effect with lots of medications. One example that's pretty high yield for the step is spironolactone can cause gynecomastia. And then the treatment varies. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Oftentimes uh, the way they would present this in questions is some sort of medication is causing it. So you need to kind of go through your medications and see if you need to discontinue any, or they may just tell you that a baby has a uh, proliferation of mammary tissue, they're developing breast, and the mother's worried, and they're going to say, what do we do? Is this a problem? The answer is going to be, no, this is not a problem. This is normal. Okay, so that's gynecomastia. So that is the primary features of benign breast condition, the primary diseases and symptoms and conditions within the benign group of breast pathology. The next video I'm going to be covering uh, there's going to be two more. The next one I'm going to go into is malignant breast conditions. And the last one I'm going to cover is going to be on congenital breast anomalies. Okay, so things that are messed up in the process of embryology as you're developing. All right, so I hope this helped and I will see you in another video. Bye, guys.